Is it your job as an American Christian to keep people who are different from you out of the United States? Or is it your job to get them into the kingdom of God through the blood of Christ Jesus? As Christians, we like to think that Scripture informs our views, whether it comes to abortion or family values or the environment. But when you hear people talking about immigration, they're looking at it from a political standpoint. I've met so many people who have lived in our nation for 20 years, and they want to become good citizens of this nation, and they came here legally. Sure, there's a percentage that came illegally and so forth. However, both sides, those who came legally and those who came illegally, the church should address them the same way, with love, because that's what Jesus would do. I know when I first started thinking about it, I related to it mostly as an offended citizen. You know, I said, look, these people are here illegally. And from a rule of law perspective, that's offensive. But then I was challenged to ask myself, not so much how I would think about this in terms of being a citizen, but how I would think about this in terms of being a Christian. And that drove me to the Bible. God has a heart for aliens, for travelers, for sojourners. God tells his people, Israel, welcome the stranger among you, for you two were strangers in a strange land. It means loving those who are different than you and caring for brokenness and broken people and broken situations. They aren't strangers to God. In fact, God knew them before the beginning of time, just like he knew any of us. I said, God, thank you for being with me, for being my friend, for being my father, because I have many problems, but I know I have you. I have the Lord with me. And what was sustaining me was an incredible group of women who were praying for me and with me. I mean, literally, prayed us back here. Paul writes that from one man, God created all the nations. And it says that he ordained or he predetermined the times and places where they should live. Because God has a purpose for this. He has a plan. He moves people around the earth on purpose. And Acts 17, 27 says it clearly, so that they should seek Him. So we as Christians, if we believe the Bible, if we take God at what He says, if we want to obey His commands, then we need to welcome the stranger. Kaleidoscope is an intentionally multi-ethnic Southern Baptist Church in South Carolina. So it's a very relational place where no matter where you're from, no matter the color of your skin, you are welcomed. Being in church with immigrants, living life with immigrants, worshiping with immigrants, breaking bread, having communion with them, it all changes your perspective because they, they go from a they group to a us group. They're our brothers and sisters. We are a community of faith together. I mean, in our church, we know people who came to this country undocumented. They became Christians here. Well, would you say to them, I wish you hadn't come here and weren't a Christian? 
I do not view this as a liberal versus conservative issue. I don't view this necessarily as a political issue. For me, it's a biblical issue. It's a Christian issue. It's a human issue. I'm from Mexico, and uh, I came to the United States uh, when I was 16. I just came here because in my house there, there was many problems, and I decided to come to this country. I mean, that was the opportunity to, to change my life. We came to Georgia, and uh, we started to work over there. And that was so hard for me, but um, they pay good. I mean, enough for us when we make our first check, that was like maybe 250. That was too much for us, and I said, wow. When he hit me, sometimes um, he take the phone and everything, and I don't have no family here to, to call somebody and say, please help me. And my husband told me, if I call the police, that's gonna happen to you. They're gonna take the kids and they're gonna move you to Mexico. When they arrived, her husband opened the door and the police asked what's going on. He tells her, if you tell them what I've done to you, I will kill you. But he said it in Spanish, so the policeman did not understand it. Well, that meant that no police report was filed. When I was thinking only we were for maybe three days, because I, I said, maybe my husband is gonna understand and he's gonna change and everything's gonna be okay. But nothing happened. At that time, I don't believe in God, like right now. But I remember I asked God, please help me. I don't know what to do. Now what happened is his brothers came from Mexico and got him because they saw that he was spinning out of control. Well, now he's back in Mexico. He's, he's orphaned his kids and left his wife. And he's told her, if you ever come to Mexico, I will kill you. And his son, who I baptized in my swimming pool, has told me about times when he saw his dad with a gun, holding it on his mom. We never received no money for, from them, from him. No money, no, nothing. So, that's all. I am working right now, cleaning houses, and it's hard for me to, but I am trying to do my best. I pay my taxes, and I am willing to do anything. I am willing to do it because I love my kids, and I want the best for them. She wants to pay taxes because she's a Christian, and she's read Romans 13. The same passage that people are using to say she shouldn't be here is the passage that she's using as a believer to obey the laws in the United States. Imagine that. They said, Mommy, can we go to the library? I said, okay, let's go. But I don't know if I go back. See, I don't know, because if the police stop me, I don't know what is gonna happen. It is a constant fear of not knowing if she's all right while she's driving. The little one, she says, Mom, I have bad dreams and people take me somewhere else. I say, why? Because you're not here anymore with us. I just try to be strong and, and tell her to, I, I never, I never going to leave you, okay? I love you. And she cried. 
and I've thought about, would I be willing to take her kids in? I've thought about where, what rooms would they go in? Her kids don't speak Spanish well, well enough to move to Mexico. She would never leave her children. What mother, what mother would do that? If she's deported, imagine what that means to the taxpayer. Because now the taxpayer has to raise her children. Not only are they away from her, their mom, these are American orphans that the government orphaned. My reason to come to this country, God know, and thanks to him I am here, and thanks to him I am living with him, and I believe God um, is going to help me, no matter where, no matter where. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. We hear people talking all the time about, well, they just need to get in the back of the line with everybody else, talking about the pathway to citizenship or to status. There is no line. There's no line. Worthy is the Lamb of God, amen? We're so glad you're with us here this morning. We're so glad you came out of your beds and said, I gotta go to church. I need to hear from God. A few months ago, I went to Huddle, Texas. And I met uh, 398 women that this nation arrested because they were undocumented. I said, how many of you all are evangelicals? That you've come, you've accepted Jesus Christ, maybe in your native country, you're here. Maybe 80% of the women raised their hand and said, I'm your sister. Our churches now are seeing people who are here illegally come to know the Lord and we're baptizing them and we're getting to know them, we're getting to know their families, we're getting to know their children. So they're not simply a statistic out there anymore. It's the lady that works at a department store who cleans windows, who pays her taxes, who gives her tithings to the church. That's exactly what we want in the United States. People that are involved with their families and our communities, but yet we're quickly to deport them thinking that's the answer. For the person who's watching this and say, wait, well, Pastor Choco, uh, these people broke the law, they should pay. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. They should pay a penalty. I'm not saying they shouldn't pay, but what I'm saying is that after they pay the penalty, then what's the system? What's, what's the pathway? Let's get them through a pathway of citizenship. We need to make sure, uh, certainly, that we secure the borders. And we need to make sure that whatever we're doing respects law. You know, we are a nation of laws. We need to make sure that we're not simply, for example, providing amnesty um, on this particular question. I'm not talking about amnesty. I'm talking about create a pathway and get this right. The Republicans and the Democrats, get this right. We're in a situation where families are separated, um, where children are living without a mother or a father, and uh, in many instances where uh, folks are having to live in the shadows rather than come out into all that society has to offer and even to enjoy the entire life that church offers for them because they're, quite frankly, they're afraid uh, to be seen. That's the role of the church, to respond without asking questions of how you got here. The reality is, is that you're here and we need to be Jesus to you. God created everybody in His image. God created man, God created marriage, God created family. And so for me, these are institutions that are non-negotiable that we have to address as a church. That the family's intact, that marriages are intact, because God created these institutions. My name is Luann Chen Huska, and I was born in China, and I moved to the U.S. when I was three with my mom and dad. My dad studied engineering and got his master's here. We all came to the U.S. under my dad's student visa. He then got a job, and um, his work sponsored him for a green card. So um, me and my mom and dad were all on our way to getting a green card. Maybe just 
one or two years away from getting the green card when my parents got divorced. At that point, my mom was kicked off the application because she was no longer my dad's spouse, so was no longer able to continue the process to get her green card. I had heard people speaking in hushed voices about people blacking out is what they call it in Chinese, and it just means that their visa ran out and they became undocumented. For her, it wasn't really that much of a decision because she knew that she wanted to stay in the U.S. because I was living here, so, you know, she just wanted to be around her daughter. She couldn't really work any jobs that required you to have a, a valid social security. I mean, she did have a social security, but it didn't allow her to work. So she decided to um, start a business with a, a friend that she knew previously, um, a Chinese restaurant. My stepdad is from China. He's from a province called Fujian, and he came to the U.S. in 1991 on a boat, so he came illegally just for economic opportunity. Um, I think he had gotten up to a middle school education in China, so he really didn't have too many options. Um, I think he probably saw his life in China as being a lot of working really hard for not that much money. As I got older, I started realizing that my parents were undocumented, but mainly we lived a pretty normal life. Worked, went to school, had friends. My parents, they had grown up in communist China, and so they were raised atheists. And when they came to the U.S., and by the time they were divorced, they still were non-believers. I became a Christian through a friend in um, junior high who started taking me to church. And then after a few years, I um, found a Chinese church for my mom and stepdad to attend. Um, and eventually they, they were baptized and became part of the church. I, I brought the um, Jesus movie to him and he watched it in Chinese and you know he said the prayer and became a Christian through that. My parents wanted me to attend Ivy League schools. I actually had applications prepared for um, Columbia in New York and Stanford, um, like the early application thing. And then um, I ended up being matched with um, a full scholarship to Wheaton College. Like, and I received that actually like the day before I was gonna send out my applications to Columbia and um, Stanford. So I just felt like God had opened the way for me to go to school at Wheaton and um, just went with that. What happened was that morning, my mom and stepdad were getting ready to go to work. That there was a knock on the door and it was um, some immigration and customs enforcement officers who had deportation orders for both my mom and stepdad. And I think because they had kids, they didn't take both of them. So they left my mom and they detained my stepdad. And there was no like, um, we'll give you a day or two to get your things together. They just came to the door and picked him up and took him to the detention facility. At the time, they were nine and seven when my stepdad was detained and then he spent nine months in the detention facility, and then he was deported in March of 2009. At first, there was an element of like shame and embarrassment that I shared with, I think, my siblings of having some, you know, a family member in prison. I was worried about sharing with my church family too. I wasn't sure if it was justified to ask for prayer, like my family was doing something wrong. I did end up asking for prayer and sharing with my friends. And um, for the most part, everybody was very um, sympathetic and understanding. And 
she was going to try to keep running the restaurant even though my stepdad wasn't there and they ran it together. So I had to go back immediately to, you know, do damage control. And, and also, um, my mom speaks English pretty well, but um, for like legal issues and certain things, she usually has me help out. So I kind of needed to step in to be kind of like a mediator, or translator person. So we married in 2009. Um, that was actually the same year that my stepdad was deported. It's kind of interesting to have like a member of the family kind of like kind of leave the family or be taken out of the family. And then he kind of came into the family at the same time. It's funny because the first time that my husband, who was then my boyfriend, saw my stepdad, he was in the detention facility. So he saw him through a um, plexiglass window. <laughs> There was definitely the understanding that if she got taken away, I would um, have to, you know, drop stuff at Wheaton and take care of my siblings and tie up loose ends if that needed to happen. They had to shut down the restaurant because um, she was just running ragged, trying to raise two kids and run a restaurant by herself. And then she didn't have legal working status, so um, she was just working odd jobs, like as a waitress or as a sushi maker. Um, here and there. Even though it's been really heartbreaking, um, I do look forward to, you know, having my family be reunited. And even in, in this hard process of them being separated, we're still living life, you know, I do see hope even amidst all the difficulties. Our country will be more secure when we know who's here. You can't just deal with border security without dealing with the entire immigration system. We need to take care of all aspects at the same time. It's not just dealing with one thing. There are lots of fears about the impact of immigration reform on the lives of Americans. But it's important to recognize that immigration reform can be a path to a much better life for Americans. Without immigration, our population shrinks. Well, we're not going to be a big, strong economy with a smaller population. We need a bigger population. The U.S. is almost unique among the large developed countries in that we have never used immigration as a tool of economic policy. We've never said, you know, we have needs in high tech, we have needs in agriculture, we have needs in construction. How are we going to use immigration as part of our goals in meeting those needs? Other countries do. The law does matter. We have to respect the rule of law. But we also have to recognize that there are times when the laws aren't working and you make changes. I'm an economist, I stare at the data. The data tell a story. And if you step back and look at the implications of serious immigration reform, it would do dramatic things for the US budget. Uh, we've looked at uh, some examples of immigration reforms that would raise economic growth by about a percentage point over the next 10 years. Doesn't sound very dramatic. That turns into two and a half trillion dollars in lower budget deficits. That'd be a very important thing. And for the average American, that's about $1,500 in higher per capita income. No one benefits in this country if we have a permanent underclass of people living here. The best way the entire country and the economy improves is for everyone to fulfill their potential. People who are living in the shadows don't fulfill their personal potential. I think the most damaging myth is the notion that somehow you could deport 11 million who are here illegally and somehow not harm the U.S. economy. The U.S. is the best market in the world, and it's the place with the best skills. To damage that by getting rid of immigrants is to damage our ability as a competitor in the global market.
It's being said that these illegal immigrants take jobs from Americans. For every person that we have holding those just back-breaking, hard, repetitive jobs, there are two and a half to three jobs upstream and downstream, be it suppliers, be it retailers, be it supervisors, truck drivers, salespeople, that will not have a job if we cannot find that labor to do the actual hard work inside our industry. And when I say our industry, I mean all of agriculture. There is this great fear that an influx of immigration will drive down U.S. wages, particularly for those who don't make a lot. And I think the fear comes from a very legitimate place. I think the important thing to recognize is immigration reform is something that's evaluated over 10, 20, 30 year horizons. We don't do it very often, it's difficult. I think we've proven that. And it has to be quite durable. So think about it from the point of view of, over the long run, what will it do? If we don't have the labor inside our country, inside the United States, to pick the fruits, vegetables, flowers for that matter, then that production will move offshore. Your vegetables will be picked by foreign hands, either inside our border or outside of our border. Our immigration laws have not kept up with reality and changes in our society. I'm an immigrant. I came here uh, with a uh, visa, and I had to leave the country with my family to get my visa renewed. It's bureaucracy to the fullest extent that it doesn't work. I'm Bruce Stewart. We have a son, Michael, aged 19, and a daughter, Sarah, aged 24. And my wife and I, Diane and myself, we are from South Africa. They've said that the work that I'm doing is saving lives on the battlefield. Um, it's an honor to be an immigrant and to be asked by the US military to go out and, uh, and train these guys. Sometimes I forget actually that I'm from South Africa because I've been here for such a long time. And I went to middle school, uh, high school, undergrad and now grad school in the States. I go to NC State uh, in Raleigh and I am a mechanical engineer. I feel like somebody that can do a good accent. That's about the only relation that I have to like being South African, that and a passport, but I'm completely American. So we go into a meeting with attorney number two and he's got the final phone and he said, I think we've got a problem here. I need to make a phone call and get somebody from ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So he phones ICE and ICE sends somebody up and has a look at the documentation and said, this documentation is all forged. Never in my wildest dreams would I have ever thought that somebody who was an attorney would be practicing in broad daylight on the high street in America as an attorney and not be one. And she turned out to be a complete fraud and a crook. And I had no recourse. There was no extension available to me. There was no other legal option open to me. There was no other visa I could apply for. There was nothing. So in desperation, I approached all of our representatives here. And I asked our senators of North Carolina, both of them, whether they would help.
So we left DC in March, just broken hearted that we had got right to the top of the US government and it had failed. The military had no choice, but they had to uh, cut me off at the knees. And they said, listen, as much as we don't like it, we've been given instructions from Washington that it would be wrong for the United States military to be employing the services of an overstay in the United States. So my income pretty much died overnight. Sarah is in college. Michael is almost about to finish his junior year in high school. And for some unknown reason, in 1951, when Bruce was born in South Africa, his father registered his birth as a foreign birth in Ireland because Bruce's grandfather was an Irishman. So there were three Irish passports waiting for us to use. Mm. We were self-deporting ourselves. You hear, people need to self-deport themselves and go back to their country of origin and then apply to come back the proper way. The Stuarts did it. We're on a long holiday with no job back at home, no house back at home, and no prospects of any income. And it's flowing out because we're paying euros. <laughs> so that, that's, that's scary. You so don't want to take a 111 day holiday. It was really scary. I didn't know if I was going to come back to school, if I was ever going to see my friends again, if I was ever going to come home. And it was not fun. So now we're, we're on homeless. Wow. And my daughter is back here by herself. And she goes and sees her doctor for a regular check and the doctor says, you're going into surgery this afternoon in two hours time, otherwise you're going to be dead. So she goes in for emergency surgery on her own. And no we, mom. And we her. can't get back into the country. And we can't <clears throat> come back to her. I have never felt so alone and kind of abandoned. Just coming home to an empty house, not seeing my family for four months. So now we're back to square one in Dublin. And I say to the attorney, there's a just one more option. And my nephew says, I think Bruce can get an O visa. Now an O visa is for Nobel Prize winners. Really seriously smart people get O visas. It's not me. And famous people. And Bruce is going, nah, that's not me. Mm -mm. <laughs> and Sean says, you know what? I've read the requirements and Bruce gets every one. Let's try. And he looked down at his phone and it said, your O visa has been approved. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we think all is well. Make an appointment at the United States Embassy in Dublin and we go in for an interview, which is the last step before you can get on a plane. And we go down there and we just have the most dreadful interview that I think I've ever been in my life. For some reason, this man decided that Bruce shouldn't have gotten an O visa. Like, who are you? He said, you're manipulating the system and I don't think you deserve to have this visa. And I said to him, have you actually read the petition? And he said, no. So here he's making a decision and he hasn't even read the motivating arguments. He hasn't read the letters from the military. He hasn't let, read the testimonials from the politician. And he said, I'm going to get a reversal on your... Mm. I'm oh, oh yeah, I forgot that. I'm going to get a reversal. I'm going to reverse this decision. I don't believe this is the correct decision. They, they made a mistake. Five weeks go by. We are stuck in Dublin. We cannot move anywhere in the world. And he can just keep those passports indefinitely. And what was sustaining me was an incredible group of women who were praying for me and with me. And who prayed us back here. 
I mean, literally, they prayed us back here. Unbelievable miracle happened. We get a call from the embassy saying, come on Thursday the 13th and collect your passports. With the visas? With the visas in them. Just like that. Come get them. could come any minute. But it will be a bittersweet moment for us because Sarah, my daughter, will not be included. Because she's aged out, she turned 21 and she lost the family's protection, the, the, the family's filing petition. I would be separated from my family, which would be heartbreaking because after all this time of, we will not separate. The system doesn't work for everybody because not everybody has, first of all, the legal background that I've got that I could put into it. Secondly, the articulateness. We, we're English speakers and the laws are all in English. So for somebody who doesn't have English as a mother tongue, not all that easy. Thirdly, we have the financial resources to be able to make the system work for us. And fourthly, we've had the support of the community. Um, they fought with bows and arrows. I think in terms of total cost of outlays, legal fees, filing fees, loss of business, we're looking at roughly a quarter of a million dollars that this little experiment with coming to the United States has cost us so far. We gotta get our labor force legalized. But then I come back to my own perspective. I came here to work. And these people come here to work. But right now, our immigration system does not allow them to ever become legal. Every year we don't do a serious immigration reform is a missed opportunity. It's another year that we've said, we don't want to take advantage of a better future. We want to just live with the status quo. And to me, that is a shame. This is not a political issue. This is a moral issue. And the moral issue is that we have a moral responsibility to respond as a church. We should be getting our moral compass from the Bible. And if we did that, then we would welcome the stranger. We would care of the poor. We would take care of the needy. Regardless if you're from Africa, Guatemala, Santo Domingo, Russia, Ukraine, we should welcome them in as a church. So let's figure out how to fix this in a way that respects the principle of what the law is supposed to be accomplishing, and let's fix the law so that it works, so that we don't ever come back to this again, but let's also deal compassionately and humanely with these folks who have been living peacefully with us and uh, contributing to the well-being of our society. When an American welcomes and loves and serves an immigrant, in the United States. You are welcoming, loving, and serving Jesus Christ. It's from his lips, it's not from mine. The Bible is as clear as it can be to me. So I think we need to pray. I think we need to advocate. I think we need to educate people who don't know, who are ignorant on this, who've never thought of this, or who have all the wrong information. We need to help correct that. So I'm a firm believer that with revelation comes responsibility. God will reveal to everyone who's watching that we as a church have a responsibility. People are tired of waiting. The time is now. My friends who have no other options, their life is going on. There's many different angles that have to be considered, but it's not an option to wait because the situation is only getting worse.
other men Full to the heart thy brother Where pity dwells The peace of God is there To worship rightly Is to love each other Each smile of him Each kindly deed of the widow and the father